The first lesson is from the seventh chapter of Amos, the sign of the plumb line, God's judgment on Israel. Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Israel, uh, uh, the high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the lands of Judah, Earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, Prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is from the first chapter of Ephesians. Chosen in Christ to live the praise of God's glory. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, 
having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who are the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. According to Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in Jesus. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill John the Baptist. But she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that John was a righteous and holy man, and Herod protected him. When Herod listened to John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. But she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? Her mother replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. And immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with others to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And then the girl gave it to her mother. 
When the disciples heard about it, they came and they took John's body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. I was a Sunday school teacher long before I was ever a pastor. I had a group of youth that I taught all the way from first grade through fifth grade, same kids every year. And we followed the lectionary uh, for our lessons in our uh, Sunday school class. So Augsburg Fortress, you know, published the lessons and they matched the gospel, usually the gospel of the day. So there they were, I think maybe at this point, fourth grade, because we were in the new part of the building. I remember it very distinctly. And they were sitting around, and they had their Bibles open, and they're looking for what we're supposed to be reading. And in the course of that, one of my more observant youth happened to be skimming along all the different headings of all the stories as they're listed in the scripture and all of a sudden there was a gasp very loud gasp and then a proclamation john the baptist got his head cut off wow wow i mean not surprising that that was interesting to that um group of kids i mean they hadn't apparently heard it or maybe just not taken note of it before, but it was shocking. It was shocking. And the, the child shared the news with their classmates. Now then, of course, it started to become a little bit of like rubbernecking. Where? Where? Where is it? And they all wanted to look, and I said, that's not where we're at today, but I promise we'll talk about it later. And I did. I did. I kept my promise. It's shocking, shocking and a little sickening, definitely saddening to hear the violence in this scripture story. And of course, we know that John, um, John's death and the way his disciples come and care for him and lay him in a tomb gives us a glimpse, a glimpse into the future of what is going to happen for Jesus, Jesus and his disciples. So John, John's a prophet, a prophet. He is the last of the great prophets here to proclaim, to lead the way, to point us to Jesus, to the Messiah. Really, that's the job of prophets in general, to point us to God, to share with us God's word. And sometimes it's good news, and sometimes it convicts us. It reminds us that um, although we are beloved and chosen by God and gifted with all of good God's good gifts, that we also have a long way to go. We also have a long way to go. Now, Amos wasn't the first prophet that went and spoke to a king of Israel, right? There were plenty of them. Now, the prophets had two jobs, really. Um, we often hear prophets come and warn, not so much to predict the future, right? It, it's not a prophecy in saying this is what will happen somewhere down the road. Really, no, they're there to state the obvious. <laughs> this is the path you're on. And if you stay on this path, this is where you're going to end up. It's not so much predicting the future, but being able to read the writing on the wall, seeing where the current path will lead the king, the king's people, the country. So those were the that was the prophet's job. But then also... Also to remind the people that they belong to God, that God loved them, and that someday God would bring them out of exile, bring them 
home. So, two sides to being a prophet. And we can see why Amos got the reaction he got. Why he was being sent away from uh, spreading the word, the message, the truth that he was sent to tell. It says right there even that, that the people cannot bear to hear your words. They don't want to hear. They don't want to change. Maybe they do want to change. Maybe they do, but they just don't know how. But the king, the king does not want to change in that sense. Because, well, power. Power. Power is, well, it's dangerous, right? Kind of like the words of the prophet. It can do a really good thing. It can do lots of good things. But it can also be dangerous, especially when the person in power is afraid. Fear and power are not a very good combination. So Amos, the prophet, sent away being told we cannot bear to hear your words. And John the Baptist speaking truth to the king, a king who saw him as righteous and holy and who was interested and perplexed and drawn in by his words and liked to listen to him. But then also did not want to be told when his actions might be taking him down the wrong path. Now Herod was sort of tricked. He was tricked into what happened, but he still had a choice. There was a moment where Herod could say, yes, I gave my word in front of all of these people, but you know what? It's a silly promise on a birthday party to a, to a young girl. We're talking about a man's life. Herod could have chosen differently. He had the power to do so. But he also had the power to take John's life. So in the midst of this, though, in the midst of these two stories about prophets that are being challenged, as putting it lightly, right, in their jobs, in their calling to go out and share God's word and message and truth, and... The message isn't being welcomed, and they are not getting a great reception. But in the middle of all this, in the middle of this, we hear from the letter to the Ephesians. The letter to the Ephesians that gives us a promise. Promises that we are chosen. And then to notice that that choice comes first. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In other words, that's been God's idea, God's hope for the world all along. To choose the world and everything in it and for that world to be holy, marked, beloved, chosen. We see at the end the words that in hearing the word of truth, in hearing about the gospel of salvation or the gospel that saves us, that sets us free. And having believed it, well, then we were marked, marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. We hear those words in baptism. Child of God, you are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit sealed with the, with the seal of the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever, right? And the sign of the cross is placed on the baptized forehead. We can't see it. We can't see that mark, but it's there. It's always there. And it reminds us, reminds us 
that we were chosen. But not because we're so awesomely special, although there's a lot of that in God's eyes. We're beloved. We're special. But God also sees us as we are. God wants this world to be better, to do better. And so we have prophets. We have prophets. Can you be a prophet? Can I be a prophet? Can we see what happens to prophets? Can can we do it? With the promise that we're sent out, that we're chosen, that we're loved before anything else, and that we've been given grace, that we've been given love, that we are taken in as God's holy purpose for creating a world that is equitable and loving and inclusive and safe and where everyone has enough. That was the plan from the foundation, from the very beginning. That was God's intention. And so we continue We continue to hope in that promise and to tell that story. To tell the story of what it can be like. What it is like. What it is like when the kingdom breaks through, when we care for one another, when people serve one another, when people forgive one another, when they they find ways to work together for the good of other people. The little internet glitch (laughs) interfered with me. Um, At least I thought it was going to interfere with me printing things out. So I took a lot of notes quickly. And I apologize if I seem a um, a little off kilter. But... It really is time, time for the message, a message that God is about love and that we as God's people are about loving one another. Now, that's not a blank check, right? That would be cheap grace. We know that that's cheap grace. But it's because we're loved, because we're given that holy, that holy purpose that we that we step forward, that we can and will and make possible and do what it is that God calls us to do. So what does it look like? What are we called to do? To listen to one another? To find ways to work together? Not necessarily always agreeing, but being able to find ways that we make this world a safe, a healthy, an inclusive, and a loving place for everyone in it. Because as we saw when I talked with the children, it was as simple as that example of the two teams and people choosing sides. And then God saying, you're all on my team. And then the question of, well, what happens to the other person choosing the sides? They get to come in, too. God welcomes them in, too. It was really sort of inevitable that John speaking the way he spoke and telling the truth in the way he did and pointing to Jesus, that it would threaten people in power and that it would cause them fear and that they might react in ways that they would be willing to do almost anything to protect themselves. And then in pointing to Jesus, Jesus also did the same thing. He spoke up for all the same things. 
and he was silenced. But out of his death comes new life. God's purpose for life, for grace, for forgiveness, for choosing the whole world to be holy. That's what wins. That's what wins in the end. That's what the resurrection is about. The promise that we hear in Ephesians. That all of this mess that we create that there's hope for it. There's hope for us. The promise is always about life over death, and love over hate, and compassion over indifference, peace over violence. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, help us to hear. Help us to open our ears and hear the words that you give to your faithful people. Help us to hear words not of condemnation, but words of love, of hope, and of promise. Life wins, love wins. Help us to live that out. Help us to trust in that. And help us to speak it. Speak it as prophets everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus. 